It's always stuffy. It's always, well, it's all the biochemistry that does that to you, right? So. Or that could be the stuffy hot air that's coming from the professor, too. You never know. So, I mean, probably before I open my mouth, it's nice and cool, and then the temperature just starts rising, right? Okay, folks, let's get started. So the last day before the uh, midterm, how's everybody doing with their studying? <laughs> Getting it together? Hopefully. Okay, so um, I've gotten it about three quarters written and um, I'm trying to make it as straightforward as I can. So I really, as, as always, always try to hit the highlights for you. But I recognize there's a lot of highlights, so that's, that's important. Uh, the uh, format of the exam will be exactly as before. That is, you'll have a little short, um, essentially true-false section at the beginning. You will have a uh, short answer section that will be about, I think last time I had 17 questions, and I think it's going to be about the same this time. And then the last uh, section will be longer in problem solving. And uh, so the point distribution of the sections will be the same as last time, I think. So it'll be... 15 points for the first one, I think 50 or 51 points for the second one, and about 34, 35 points for the third section. So that's the sort of distribution that we'll have on the, on the exam. Okay, well, I'm about a day behind in my lecture, and I moved the lectures forward today, but I forgot to move the outlines forward today. So I'm, if you look at the, 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 the schedule page, you see it's a little cockeyed, but I'll get that straightened out. All of the videos and uh, audios and everything, including the review session, have all been posted, and they're all available on the uh, schedule page. So. Take advantage of those. When you come in on, on Friday, please scatter yourselves out as before so we get seated quickly and get the exam started quickly so you have plenty of time to get through and do everything. Okay. Uh, well, we're moving on now on another metabolic pathway. Um, and like the first metabolic pathway, absolutely essential, found in virtually every cell on the face of the earth. Okay. Glycolysis is found in virtually every cell on the face of the earth. And similarly, this pathway is as well. These pathways are what we call central metabolic pathways. And they're central partly because they are so essential for so many different uh, cells. And central in the sense that this is a main interstate highway, and a lot of offshoot highways come off of them. Okay? So I keep describing going up to Portland, but I want you to sort of think about this in your head the other way. We're going south. I usually like to think of breakdown pathways going down and synthesis pathways going up. So if we do that, then we, th we think of Seattle as being glycogen. Okay? We think of Portland as being glucose. We think of Eugene or maybe San Francisco as being uh, the next round below there. Notice that they are below where we are. So, um, And so the citric acid cycle is a main pathway, and it's, it's further down the line, down I-5. It's central because there's a lot of highways that are going to come off of that. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that. We won't talk an awful lot about that, but I will point out to you where some amino acid metabolism, for example, comes off of this uh, pathway. Okay, well, central metabolic pathways, you can sort of see the schematic here. I don't particularly like this figure. I think it's kind of a stupid figure. Um, but it gives you the same general idea. Instead of going up and down, now we're going left to right. The citric acid cycle is a cycle. It works in a circle. And uh, I'll have some things to say about that. The citric acid cycle is a major oxidative pathway. A major oxidative pathway. Glycolysis was not a major oxidative pathway. There was only one oxidation that occurred in glycolysis. In the citric acid cycle, there are four separate oxidations that occur. And those oxidations lead to the production of carbon dioxide. So one of the reasons we exhale carbon dioxide is because our oxidation is producing carbon dioxide from the sugars and fats that we have eaten. We'll see fats later, uh, but suffice it to say that oxidation is going to produce carbon dioxide. Okay? You'll notice that oxidation in the citric acid cycle produces reduced electron carriers. So the oxidation occurs in the pathway. When I said where there's an oxidation, there has to be a reduction. And what's getting reduced are electron carriers. There are three NADHs that are produced. And there is one FADH2 produced. 
And that's for each pyruvate that comes in. Okay? For each pyruvate that comes in, in the cycle, that's what we're going to see. Now, pyruvate doesn't come directly into the cycle. That's another thing I've got to point out to you. And in order to get into the cycle, there's yet another NADH that's produced. So we see a lot of elect reduced electron carriers that are produced in getting from glycolysis all the way through the citric acid cycle. And I'm going to be showing you uh, how all those uh, come about. OK. In order to talk about the citric acid cycle, we have to start talking about cellular structure. When we talked about glycolysis, we learned a little bit of that. First of all, we said that the cytoplasm was where all of glycolysis occurred and most of gluconeogenesis. Most of gluconeogenesis did not include the first reaction and the last reaction of gluconeogenesis, which occurred in the mitochondria um, in the case of the first reaction or in the endoplasmic reticulum in the case of the last reaction. In the citric acid cycle, everything occurs in the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is what we refer to, of course, as the power plant of the cell. And that power plant of the cell is important because a lot of oxidation is going on there. A lot of reduced electron carriers are produced there. And as we'll see in the lecture on next week, a lot of ATP is, re is produced as a result of those reduced electron carriers. So the mitochondrion is a hopping place. And it's important for us to understand a little bit of the structure of the mitochondria in order for us to understand uh, what's happening. What you see on the top is a schematic uh, of mitochondria. And down below is not a very good figure that's enlarged. And I think this is probably a little better up here. Cells have ranging from a few mitochondria up to maybe 500 mitochondria, depending upon the type of cell that they are. The more mitochondria they have, the greater their energy needs, no surprise. The mitochondria uh, is an interesting little organelle. It's one of only two organelles that's known to have its own DNA. Mitochondria has its, have their own DNA. The chloroplast is the other one. Chloroplast, uh, chloroplasts have their own DNA. That means mitochondria code for some proteins that they use. A lot of the proteins that mitochondria use are actually encoded by the cell's genome and they get moved into the mitochondria. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay? Well, for our purposes, we're interested in anatomy of the mitochondria. And with respect to the anatomy, there's several features we need to, to uh, discuss. I'll start in the middle. At the very center of the mitochondrion, there is um, an open chamber. That open chamber is filled with liquid. And we can think of that liquid as being the sort of equivalent of the cytoplasm of the cell. All right. So the center of the mitochondrion has liquid. That liquid dissolves all but one enzyme of the citric acid cycle. That liquid is contained in what's called the matrix of the mitochondrion. So the matrix is a fluid-filled chamber of the mitochondrion. There's a lot of different enzymes that are found in that fluid. You'll notice that the mitochondria also have some infoldings. Okay? These foldings extend into the mitochondria. This shows it down here, although you don't see it very well in this figure. And these infoldings are part of a membrane that we refer to as the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. This is the most important membrane of the mitochondrion, at least for our purposes. So we have an inner membrane. It contains infoldings. The infoldings themselves have a name. And the infoldings of that inner membrane are called cristae, C-R-I-S-T-A-E. So the infolding itself is called a cristae. The, the inner membrane goes other places besides where the infoldings are. So you can see the entire structure is the inner membrane. The cristae are the parts that extend, projecting inwards into the matrix. The functions of the cristae are to give more surface area. So the more infoldings there are, there's more surface area to that inner membrane. And the inner membrane, as we're going to see, does a lot of things. The inner membrane is embedded with a lot of proteins. There's probably more proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion than in any membrane of the cell. The cell membrane doesn't have as much. Okay? The endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have as much. All right? But the inner membrane of the mitochondrion has a lot of protein embedded in it. One of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle is embedded in that inner membrane. We'll see that later. Last, there's an outer membrane that goes around 
that encloses the entire mitochondrion. That outer membrane is basically what I like to think of as a sort of a wet blanket. It's a covering around the inner membrane, but it's rather porous. A lot of things go through it. By contrast, the inner membrane is very non-porous. The only things that go through it go through in specific channel proteins. We'll see how that works. For right now, our only interest is in the, the names and the structures, the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the cristae, and the matrix. OK. Here is the citric acid cycle. And I know much as you guys would love to memorize all those structures, I'm not going to make you do that. Unless there is a, a, a groundswell of support for people, people who would like to do that. OK. I guess the vote is unanimous. So we won't do that. Like before, you'll need to know the names, and you'll need to know the names of the enzymes. These are important molecules. And they're important molecules because most of them lead to other things inside of the cell. You also need to know how many carbons are in each one. This is pretty simple, as we'll see. But that's important to know because you'll, you'll see carbons disappear as we go around the cycle. Like before, almost all of the enzyme names tell us what the reaction is catalyzed. Only one enzyme name doesn't tell us very well what's catalyzed, and I'll show you that one. Okay. Now, the cycle is a cycle. Yes, Lynette? Enzymes and the intermediates, yes. Well, the, the, the molecules, the, 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 not, the, not the transient intermediates, but certainly the names of the molecules. The cycle is a cycle. It doesn't technically have a starting point or an ending point. We traditionally start it with the entry of carbon coming from the glycolysis. And that's where I'm going to start it as well. But I want you to realize it is a cycle. And that cycle can go backwards and forwards. Okay. Now, well, let's think how we get things into this cycle. And the way that we most commonly get things into this cycle is through a molecule, is by the addition of a molecule called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can come, as you see here, from glycolysis because pyruvate can be made into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can also come from the breakdown of fatty acids. So the citric acid cycle, all it really requires to keep it going is input of acetyl-CoA from whatever source we happen to have. So now there's several highways leading into this highway. This is a kind of a a kind of a um, highway that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's, it's a beltway, right? OK. Now, um, let's talk about how we get acetyl-CoA. So we've just finished glycolysis. And we've said that well, we've got pyruvate. One of the routes from pyruvate, there were three possible things pyruvate could do. Two of the routes happened when there was no oxygen, right? One went to ethanol. One went to lactic acid. This pathway requires oxygen. All right? So when we have oxygen in whether they're bacteria or yeast or humans, they're going to use this route because this route is going to produce more ATP than any other route. If we go through oxidation all the way through glycolysis and then all the way through this, for each glucose that we started with, we will end up with approximately 38 ATPs. If we go through fermentation, we end up with two. A lot more, a lot more, OK? Now, we'll talk about that. Um, how do we get acetyl-CoA? Well, first of all, we have to have oxygen. And the reason we have to have oxygen is because we have to have NAD. NAD is required for the oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. If we don't have oxygen, we don't have NAD because the cell's having to ferment to make whatever little it can. It's going to use whatever little it can to keep glycolysis going. OK, so if we have oxygen, we produce this. We, produ 